Good afternoon to everyone and um, welcome to another day, Issues in Focus with Shibiki Vivos. And we are here to have some fun. I know when some of my friends saw the topic, they were like, what? The best sex ever? So I know if, you, if you're viewing right now, I want you to share this live broadcast to other persons on your page. Remember, persons need to know and uh, about this best sex because you can get this information nowhere else. You, you can find it right here this afternoon. So as usual, before we get into our official presentation, I'm going to pray for you guys, the persons in the audience who are viewing um, for, in a special way. So let us pray. Loving God and Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We are thankful for this afternoon. I pray, Lord, for the members of the audience. I pray that you open their minds and their understanding as we discuss this topic here today, that hearts and lives will be transformed. Have your way, we pray. Through Jesus Christ, amen. All right, great. So I have a wonderful panel here this afternoon. I know, Delon, you are fortunate to be the lone gentleman in. Hopefully, my friend can join before the program is over. Um, <laughs> hi, Danielle. Oh, happy rainy season. Well, in Trinidad, it's very hot right now. And um, I know in some other parts, they, yeah, it's raining. But we are enjoying the, 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 uh, the heat right now. So my fan is on, and I'm enjoying it. So I'm going to allow the panel, the members of the panel this afternoon, to introduce themselves to you. So you will know exactly who these individuals are. Listen, you are in for a treat this afternoon. So I'm going to start not in any particular order. So ladies, you can choose who you want to go first. I can go first. That's fine. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Maya. Um, I guess I am, I'm an attorney. I also work for a defense company. Um, and um, let me see, I also do a show actually on, um, on Facebook Live on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. every Wednesday. Um, I do the show with MC Chaz and um, we just talk about um, social issues or whatever is trending in, in the news. Um, I think that's it. Is there anything else you wanted to know? <laughs> oh, actually, okay. So I was born here, but my parents are from Nigeria. Okay. Great. So yeah, I'm very, very Nigerian. And um, uh, I connect with my roots a lot. I, I visit Nigeria a lot. So, yeah. Oh, I'm happy. So happy to have you, Miss Maya. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm Tawina Williams. And I'm from the beautiful Isle of Spice, Grenada. And currently what I do in my spare time, I love to go on nature walks. And here in Grenada, we are blessed with so many nice rivers and trees so that I can enjoy. And currently I am hosting a summer class that keeps me going. So that's who I am. <laughs> I love that. Thank you very much, Tawina. I met Tawina here at USC. And Tawina, could you tell us what was your major at USC? Oh, yes. I studied finance at USC. That's right. Great. Thank you so much for being here. All right. So the lone gentleman, go right ahead. Right. Good afternoon. My name is Milan Basin, and I'm from the island of Dominica, that's in the Eastern Caribbean. I am a student of the University of the Southern Caribbean. I am also used to serve my church as an elder and a youth leader. I love sports and I love learning more about God. Great. Thank you so much, Dylan. So, you know, you don't have to be afraid for those who have the, the, the uh, questions from the, the, from the Bible. You know, you want to ask, you want to justify. Yeah, we have, we have persons. So we have a lawyer, we have a finance personnel, we have a, a pastor on this platform. We are here to have fun. In addition to that, I'm going to share the link in the chat section. So, if anyone wants to make a comment, you, you want to come in for a few seconds and give a comment, no problem. So let me just shout out to some of my persons who are viewing today, Janessa, um, Andre, um, John, Sister Greldine, and oh, Pastor Goldman. Well, Pastor, I know you have to be here this afternoon. I'm so <laughs> your fiance is on board today. So I'm so happy that you are here today. All right, remember, I just want to say, if you're viewing from my page, um, Shibiki Vivos, you will not be able to 
uh, make a comment. I will not be able to see your comment, even if you make it under the live video there. Um, so you need to like the page. It's using focus with Shibiki Viber so that you can see comments and you can interact with us, um, with the, the, the panelists here today. So this is a stream. And if at any point in time the link is there, you feel as if you want to um, make a comment, you can. I am so happy I'm seeing Sister Melinda here. So come on, let me just get to add you to the stream. This is it. This is it. This is it. And um, there's another young man that should be joining. Hopefully, I, I hope that he gets through um, to join. All right. I'm not seeing her getting connected as yet. But we are going to go straight into it. Um, I told you the topic is the best sex ever. The best sex ever. And um, I know that many of you want to know what exactly are we talking about when we say the best sex ever. So today our panel, panel will explore that concept for us. And so I want to start with the very first question because I realize that in many cultures this has been a taboo issue. How effective and if, uh, in terms of we are currently in the 21st century and um, how important is sexual education in this century and when should parents discuss this with their children? How important is sexual education in the 21st century and when should parents discuss this with their children? All right, anyone, anyone could start. Well, well, I could begin. I mean, um, well, I'm not a parent, but um, I can share. Uh, when, when I think about the 21st century, you know, when you look at the world today with the advent, you know, of technology, you know, every child has a tablet, every teenager or young person, elderly has a, a cell phone. You know, even today, you know, I'm streaming cricket you know, on my computer and, you know, as naked ladies, you know, just keep popping up and popping up and popping up. So, you know, with all with all that pollution, you know, that you have on the social media and in the world today in the 21st century, all that pollution that, you know, Satan has brought with this gift of God, then I believe, you know, sexual education it even, is even more relevant now than it was before. And, and, you know, the spirit of prophecy says that, you know, parents should start to instill lessons of self-control in their children, even in the cradle. Hmm? So that's a very early start, you know, to start teaching children about self-control and all these things. And, you know, I believe that, you know, it should be a gradual process. I mean, you don't give them everything at the same time, but gradually you give them enough so that when they get to at least primary school, because when, when they get to primary school, you know, they're, they're exposed, you know. So when they get to primary school, they should know enough so that they can be able to distinguish between wrong from right when it comes to, you know, the topic of sex. Okay, great, great, great. Thank you. Who'll be next? I can go next. Um, I agree with um, past, Pastor Dylan. Um, I think that, you know, just as soon as you believe, because some, some kids mature faster than others. Um, I have, you know, seven-year-old nephews who are like 15. So um, I think as, as long as you as a parent believe that they are old enough to understand what it is, then you should definitely start that education because they're going to get it elsewhere. They're going to get it on YouTube. They're going to get it on social media, as the pastor mentioned. Um, and I, I think in the 21st century, it's definitely very, very important, um, more important than before because of that exposure. So um, I think as, as soon as possible, they should they should definitely get that the education. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I hope that all the parents out there are listening to what we are discussing here. Stop hiding sex talk from your children. Sonia, welcome to you, my dear. So we're going to go over to Torina. What's your see on it? Miss Williams? Okay, yes, so I agree with what um, Sister Maya and Dylan said, what Dylan said before, 
And it is definitely true because um, I'm not a parent as well, but you don't want your children to end up in a situation where sometimes you may say, okay, our children don't have phones or they don't, they're not exposed to a computer and we may take it for granted and they go into the school environment and they start talking with their friends and you know, they, the friends may be discussing sexual things to them and they'll be curious as to, they want to learn more and they will find themselves going and learning for themselves. And the sad thing about it is that when children go onto the internet without adult supervision, they can take, because the internet has the good and the bad. So instead of they taking the good, they may end up taking the bad. And so it can really be to a disadvantage. And you know, um, like this was saying, you take it in stages because at the same time, you don't want to give a preschooler information that they're not ready for. So, I mean, and you don't want to give maybe in a primary school, your child is a primary school student, but she's not as developed as she should be as yet. You don't want to feed her as to that information as yet. So it depends on their maturity and the level at which they are so that you can train them. Because in preschool, you may just want to teach them about their body parts and, you know, let them know that, you know, this is for you alone and men should not touch you. But then in primary school, when the hormones start kicking, you may want to know, you know, let them know that, hey, this thing is natural, but this is what you should do and this is what you should not do. And at that stage, it really would help the children because I don't know about other societies, but, you know, even here you find a lot of, you know, teenage pregnancies and stuff because of the reason that the parents maybe did not educate their children properly. And so they went out when their hormones started raging and they just act upon it. So it's very, very, very important to really educate them upon it. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Tawina. Delon, you have something to add? Yeah. You know, as you were speaking, I just come to think of the fact that, you know, it is at that age, you know, they, they say between one to seven. That is when the children, you know, learn basically the core. You know, the basic development comes at that age. So if you don't jump on that opportunity as a parent and instill in them the right values when it comes to this topic, then the wrong values will be instilled in them. Because what we know yeah. for sure is they will learn something between that age. So it's best to take the opportunity and teach them the right before they learn the wrong. Great, thank you so much. Thank you very much for your responses. I just want to say welcome to Amy Philly. I just hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Collins, and notice some of Ms. Myers guests they're here. Essie Subo, and um, of course, Danielle, you always here with us. Welcome to you guys this afternoon. Remember again, the only how you can share this video right now to someone else because they may need to learn this information. And um, by the way, I have another question that just came to my mind, folks. When was the first time you, maybe your parents spoke to you about sex or you discovered something about um, sexual intercourse, you got to find out that information. Can any one of you remember that? While you guys are thinking on that, I remember when my parents had a book, they, they, uh, it so happened that um, there was a game that came with the baby development life cycle of a child. And so we had this board game and there was a book that came to for the parents to look through where they had the mother um delivering baby everything they had taught it was plain 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 and it so happened that i found the book i was in um preparing for prep b that second grade one or grade two only about maybe seven years eight years i found the book and i read every single thing when my father saw that i read that book he was mad he was like this book is not for you guys it's not for you guys and he collected it but by then i already gained the knowledge i wanted to gain so while i was at school one day i mean my the nurses school teacher telling the children how um babies coming from plane and um when it came comes on the plane it drops off to the mother and a whole set of crap and i looked at that teacher and I said, Miss, no, that is not the correct thing you're telling the children. Babies don't come like that. I know how babies come. She looked at me. She said, come here, come here. And I ran away. But it was at that young age that I remembered personally that I, I learned about sexual intercourse. What about you as we on this? Um, I think, uh, I think for me, it wasn't like... I <laughs> 
I think I was like 25 when I ever had the conversation with my mom. Like, you know, I don't know about other African countries, but Nigerian parents, they don't talk about sex. Um, I think that's changing now, but you know, they don't talk about sex. Um, but I, I think I got the exposure before I got the actual understanding. And I think that's the case for a lot of people. Like you may see things around you going on, you know, between a man and a woman or older cousin and like another female but you don't really understand it. So I think maybe when I was like, maybe like 15 ish, that's when I actually started understanding like what they are doing, you know, so. Oh, 15. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, I'm very thinking and I, I believe, I think it was in grade three, I think when I got baptized and I was at a crusade and I think that night it was, like a lover's night, you know, normally they would put in a little lover's night, you know, and I think I, I saw they had little, you know, wedding stuff on the screen, and you know, I was so excited watching, you know, seeing these people there, and you know, I think I believe that they would have shown kissing, maybe just a man and woman kissing to show marriage and so forth, and I remember, I think I came home the night, I remember it was after nine or so, and I went and I remember asking my mom, you know, why are they doing this and what happened? And, you know, then I guess she realized because the look upon her face was like, wow, why did she have to ask me this now? <laughs> and so she took the time, she took the time to really explain it to me so that I can understand. And it, trust me, it was really good because when I went back to school, I was so happy that, you know, like you, when somebody mentioned it, like I can, you know, explain myself and, you know, be better at it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right. So I just want to say shout out to um was it Sigrelli made a comment here? Um, parents need to teach them before their friends and technology get to them. That's true. And uh, oh my goodness, I pronounce your name. Oh, I am so happy. Yes. <laughs> All right. I want to say welcome to um Yakif, Yakima. I don't know. Miss July, I don't know why they give you such a, a name, but it's a beautiful name. Um, Dylan, am I pronouncing the name correctly? Yeah, Yakima. Yakima, that's right. And um, so you're watching from some some piece of forest. I don't know. It's only Miss Maya could tell me where that is, right? <laughs> don't pay him no mind. <laughs> All right, great. All right, I want to say uh, welcome to Ashiba also, Monique. And um, okay, so Emi Philly said that he was five when he experienced something like that wow remember the link is in the um the comment section i'm gonna place the link again and if you want to join us in the stream to make a comment you can so that we can continue to have an interactive session all right great so dylan the quest the same question applies to you at yeah, what I'm, age can you remember well i can't remember exactly but what i do mm -hmm. remember is that you know when we were in primary school you know as children you would just be writing, you know, S E X on our desk and the, all over the place, and you were just laughing. And I'm today, I'm trying to think about what what was funny about that, and <laughs> and I can think about what was funny about that. But as children, that's how we, you know, that's how we used to look at it, you know, like write it all over the place and laugh and things like this. Wow. All right. Thank you very much. So my next question that I want to ask us today is, um, when it comes to the best sex ever, audience, listen. If you if you don't get anything, you gotta get this one, right? When we talk about the best sex ever, what would your description be of that? I know somebody is wondering, like, what is Shibiki asking those folks to do to describe? But they're going to tell you, what is what do you think is the concept of the best sex ever? All right, this is the part that I love. Everybody's microphone is muted, waiting for somebody to answer. <laughs> Right. I, 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 you want to go? Okay. Go to love. So I was thinking, um, well, seeing that it was created by God as a gift, then he's the one that knows how to get the best out of it. And, you know, I think that can best be described by, by using this analogy of, you know, how everyone, you know, buys a new vehicle and there is an owner's manual in the vehicle. But more often than not, we don't really read the owner's manual because... You know, we believe we know everything about the vehicle already because everybody has vehicles. You know, people tell us stuff. 
But if you go through the owner's manual properly, it will tell you, you know, what type of oil you should use and the gas and the tires and everything. It will tell you what you what you should do to get the best performance out of the vehicle because the manufacturer is the one that created the vehicle and he knows how to get the best out of it. So similarly with this gift, God is the one that created it. So he knows how to get the best out of it. And he says to get the best out of it, it should be solely used within the confines of marriage between a man and a woman. So I believe if we follow the manual's instruction or, or the one that designed it, if we follow what he said, then I believe that we can reap the best out of it and we can get the best. But we can only get the best when we follow how the manufacturer set it out for it to go. So so let me get it straight, Dylan. So you said it's it is set out between a man and a woman, right? Right. Right. So but anybody can just, it So it me. doesn't matter nothing. You can once you're a man and a woman, you could just go have sex. Well, right. as I said, with you could meet your microphone. I'm gonna take the ladies and then I'm coming back to, to you with that same. <laughs> Go ladies. <laughs> <laughs> when when I think of the concept of the best sex ever, I I believe um like the brother was saying, you know, since God created it, which is so amazing, since the fact that God created it, it's it's already the best because God created it. And I believe I believe that once it is within marriage and it is with that person that you would have you know committed your life with that and like he was saying you know it's not just really physically but it's a connection with god also so once you you know you have that inside then i believe that that should be the best sex ever all right great thank you miss maya yeah i mean i agree with both of them you know um just from a religious standpoint if that's what you believe, it should, I think the best sex ever should take place within the confines of a marriage. You know, it's guilt-free, you know, you're doing it with someone hopefully that you love and there's, you know, that intimacy and the bond there. So I think that when it's within the confines of a marriage, that's when it's the most enjoyable, so. Great, and um, none of us are married on this panel. And that is the sad part of it, right? I know Teacher Melinda should have should um she was supposed to be here, but any married person on the panel, um, that is not on the panel and you're in the audience right now. If you're married, feel free to come in to, to connect to the link that I would have shared there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> feel free to connect to the link so that you can actually you can you guys can talk to us from a marital standpoint because i was supposed to have another um another pastor who should have been here he's married but he had an emergency just before the program and he couldn't join us but any married person in the, in the uh and if you're looking at your viewing right now the link is there and feel free to comment dylan i recognize that you are the audience love you very much um they call you a manufacturer you are boy you're blessed this afternoon <laughs> <laughs> all right great so so we already established that the best sex ever is the is the in within the confines of marriage right so okay mr collins well fine if you're married could you please connect to the link here connect to the link and and uh, let us hear what you have to say feel free <laughs> i noticed miss my laughing and i don't know why she's laughing I hope you're really married for two, but I would really love to hear your voice, to hear what you have to say. I love your interaction so far with the, in the chat. Yes. Um, so, but then, you know, many of our young people would often ask um, this question, is it wrong to think about sex? Because come on, I mean, I know I think about sex, but is it wrong to think about sex? Let me hear what you have to say. Um, I can go. I don't think it's wrong, but like how much are you thinking about it? Right. Are you like constantly thinking about it, daydreaming, like, you know, making up scenes in your mind? That's when I think it's wrong, because then it's it's you're, you're falling into lust. And I mean, because when you're thinking about it, you're thinking about it with a particular person. I don't think that you're just thinking about having sex by yourself. You know what I mean? So that's when I think 
you're treading sort of in the wrong direction because now you're moving into lust. But it's okay to think about it in the sense that, oh, I can't wait to get married. So, you know, me and my husband or me and my wife can, you know, do what we need to do guilt free, you know. So I love that. I, I kind of like what she said because she didn't say whether yes or no. She said that, you know, she tried to say that like there's a godly side and there's an ungodly side. All right, so we can think about the godly side, but we should not think about the ungodly side. And you know, when I think about that question, I think about the fact that if we if we agree that it is a gift from God, is it wrong to think about God's gift? Hmm. <laughs> so, so that would be the godly side, what she just spoke about. You know, we can think about you know, I can't wait to get married. You know, that's a godly side of it. But we also have to think about the fact that you know, in the world today, there are so much you know pollution that more often than not our minds seem to drift towards the polluted side and so we cannot deny the fact that as emotional beings you know we are created with this sexual orientation so these thoughts will they'll run through our mind and even as we live in the world today there are a lot of triggers i mean you go on your phone there's a trigger you walk on the road there's a trigger you mean you go to school there are, there are triggers everywhere to make these thoughts come into your mind so it's almost impossible to completely abstain from these thoughts. But we do agree that, you know, it is not a sin to be tempted because Jesus was tempted and Jesus never sinned. So temptation cannot be a sin. But however, when you consciously and deliberately dwell on the ungodly side of it, then you begin to fall into loss. And I think that's that's when it becomes, that when it's become wrong to think about it. All right. You know, I love the fact that we have men and, uh, I mean, well, I, hope, I was hoping men, but we have a man here who is speaking like that. And I hope men in, men in the chat, just type a men, man. I love the fact you are really representing. Man, Collins, you on a roll. Yes, sex is life. Indeed. I know because when, 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 I, when I looked at that, like that's a real man talking there. I, I don't think women, you will hardly find these comments coming from women. Sex is life, right? <laughs> Always come from the men. Torina, over to you, girlfriend. Yes, um, I agree with what they said. It's like they take everything I want to say out of my mouth. But yes, it is true. At the end of the day, it's yes or no, because we are human beings. So, I mean, and I don't think we, we, we're sticks where we don't have feelings and, you know, so we are human beings. So one way or the other, we would, like you was saying, we would say, okay, we want to get married someday. We want to have sex with our partner someday. So you would think about those things. But you know, it would really it becomes a problem when you start to lust after it. So you sit down there thinking and you're like, hmm, I wonder how it would be. And then you start to go into deeper thoughts. You know, you wonder what this would be and this would be. That's where you know the kind of problems start to to appear when you start to just sit down every day. You want to dedicate a little 10 minutes, you sit down there in like a fantasy lusting world thinking of what, you know, sex should be and so forth. But I mean, it's not wrong. It's not coming to your mind. You may have conversations with your friends about, I mean, you want to get married, sex and so forth. It's not wrong. To me, it's natural. That's just, I mean, but when you go to the extreme where you settle us and stuff, that's when you're going to get yourself in a little tight position there. Thank you so much. Yes, and th thank you, uh, Pastor Liam um, Beckles. Welcome. And I love his comment, of course, concurring with what everyone would have said. Thinking about sex is almost unavoidable. We live in a sex saturated society, but it is our response to those thoughts. Excellent. Danielle, uh, I don't know. Danielle, for one of these questions, I'm definitely going to call you in. Um, I know you've been on this program one, once already, so I'll definitely call you in, Pastor Beckles. Feel free. The link is in the chat section. You can you can connect to the link at any point in time. Make a comment, and you you don't have to stay. I'll just remove you, and then we'll just continue with the discussion. Um, <clears throat> what I want to know now, in terms of and I I was surprised when it, these questions here they came from young people, and one of the questions that came from almost all the young people is like, how can we control our urges? We understand we can. It's not wrong maybe to think about sex. We want to see um well as long as we are garnering our thought process but how can we protect um control our origins when they arrive one young person once said that um well if god didn't give us hormones we wouldn't have had, had to sex at a young age because the, or, the hormones are there so 
what do you say for our panelists? How, how can young people, or not even young people, how can people in general control their urges, especially the fact that they're not married? Um, I would say I would say two things. First of all, you know, sometimes persons place themselves in a situation where more so they allow these urges to really take over their soul so that they feast on a lot of sexual things. So they would sit down and maybe the type of movies that they engage, they watch and so forth. Sometimes you just sit down and watch a bunch of love movies, you know, sexual movies, and then you catch, obviously it will react in you. So then you catch yourself, you know, having these urges and then for you, you sit down there and you don't know what to do. But hey, I was thinking that, you know, the you find things to do. So, I mean, this is the time you get to, you know, um, develop yourself. Maybe you decide to, let me take sewing. So, because the thing is the devil find work for idle persons, right? So if you have your little idle time, you know, he will try to sneak that little thing, the little urges that you try to sneak it inside there. So what you try to do is try to keep yourself occupied with things at all times so that you don't have that lapse moment where, you know, he will come at you. So you, you do sewing, or you go outside into the garden, or you read a book, you know, you keep yourself occupied. I believe in that way. I mean, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. Definitely, it's not going to be easy, but it's definitely going to be worth it in the end. And I mean, most of all, uh, you can sometimes you cannot do these things on your own. You just have to sometimes you in situations and you just have to cry out to God and ask him to, you know, just take control and help me to remain as I should. Definitely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so for me, I think that, you know, you have to, you know, frame your mindset, you know, and the way to frame your mindset is to indulge yourself with the things of Christ. You know, you're reading your word, you know, you're surrounding yourself with people who are like minded yeah. and you're focused on, you know, your goals, your aspirations. You're not really going to have a lot of time to be thinking about um, sex or you know, sexual immorality. And I like what she said about, you know, what you watch. I think people need to be very mindful about what they're watching. You know, a lot of us, we think, oh, we can't be influenced. You know, I'll just, you know, skip over it. I'll close my eyes. But you really, you know, the sound, even music is very dangerous, the type of music you're listening to. So you really need to be mindful of that because those things do insert um, spiritual, I think there are spiritual urges within you that are sinful when you indulge in them. So I think you just have to surround yourself with um, good people, people who are like-minded and also just indulging in the things of Christ, reading your word and things things of that nature. All right, great. Thank you so much, Ms. Mayo. Well, um, you know, when I think about you know, your, your battle with your urges, you know there's a song that says that this battle is not yours, it's the Lord's, right? So I think that you know the battle against your urges, it's it's the Lord's battle. <laughs> but but I think um I know I like what my fellow, you know, panelists would have said concerning what what you should put in place to sort of guard yourself against these urges. But I think um you know before you even start putting things in place, I believe that you should you know like Joseph and Daniel, you should purpose in your heart that you are not going to sin against God, because you must understand that you cannot prevent these urges; they must come. So you have to purpose in your heart, even long before they come, that you're not going to sin against God. I know it helps to understand how sacred and important your body is to God. So when you yeah. understand how sacred your body is, and when you put some value on your body, then you can begin to put things in place, you know, get your accountability partner and, you know, associate with group and people with group, with like-minded and all these things. You'll put them in place when you understand how sacred your body is. But if you don't understand or sacred your bodies to God, then you may not put anything in place to guard against these urges, and then you just fall. All right, that's from a man's perspective too. I um I, I want to Daniel Daniel, could you please connect to the link right now, Daniel Nathan? Could you please connect to the link? I would be very happy to hear, um, maybe one or two of your counsels. How you as a young man, you know, you are controlling your urges, or you know, just to help up other young men at the same time. So Daniel, if you listen to me, please connect to the stream and um, I'll be very happy to have you com comment on that. So Pastor Becker said, um, spend more time in group activities, true? 
and pray that God lead you away from sexual temptations. Eh? But remember, the group activities is not 24 7. And night time when you're there, most of the time, different things happen, different thought process, and everything. So, um, yes. So, Danielle, the link is there. You feel free to connect. Teacher Melinda, I want to say welcome to you, but I realize she's having some. Now she's connected. She's having some internet issues now. Lord Jesus, could you please work out everything we need to hear her comments this afternoon? So, Danielle, the link is there. Please, um, please feel free to connect. So let me hear your um your thoughts on that question. And then as we explore, um, there is something as I know, especially from a man's point of view. Oh my goodness. And I, I, I men in the chat section, if you don't want to join, no problem. But I want you to comment. Is virginity still relevant in the 21st century? Men, are you still looking for women who are virgins? Women, are you still, do you still want to be virgins before you marry? Delon, I see a, the brightest smile on your face since the afternoon began. So <laughs> let me hear your response to this. Is virginity still relevant in the 21st century? I, I think that's an important question, though. And you know, when I think about that aspect, I think about the, you know, ancient Near East, you know, in the biblical days, when persons would get married, they would have to consummate their marriage on a white sheet. Mm -hmm. And you know, the priest or whoever would remain outside the wedding chamber to see if that sheet would be red. And if that sheet did not turn red, then somebody would be stoned. And I know in the, in the Christian world today, we are spiritual Israel, but we do not have that hard and fast rule because, you know, people just be get, being stoned all over the place. But there is no hard and fast rule, you know, pertaining to this virginity. But we know that, we know for sure that God doesn't change. You know, his precepts, his standards, his laws, his judgments, they don't change. So if God's rule doesn't change, and if his expectations of us doesn't change, he still expects us, you know, to be a royal priesthood. If these things don't change, then I believe that this virginity is still relevant in the 21st century. And, you know, I believe that is even more important now because, you know, if all these urges, you know, if all these um, temptations and perverseness, we can actually give somebody a testimony that, you know what, here, I can remain pure until I marry, despite all what is going on in the world. I can trust the Lord, I can believe the Lord, and I can live his word, despite all the urges that is going on. So I believe it's even more important now that you can show the world a testimony that you can remain pure until you're married. All right, great. Thank you, Art. I just want to say welcome to Daniel. So, Daniel, um, I just want to know how, as a young man there, hi, Tenderness, welcome, my dear. As a young man, how were you able to control your urges? Or what advice would you give to other young men in terms of controlling their urges? All right, all right good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so, well, for me, I mean, sometimes as a young man, I even have urges, even to this day, but it takes a lot for self-control and, and self-control is a big deal. And sometimes you could be struggling with a lot of things, but one thing that carried me through is, you know, my, my, uh, the things that were taught to me growing up as a child, but even you, in spite of having those, those teachings as well, you cannot avoid the society, the environment that you're in a lot of times. Right. And sometimes you seek to be influenced by that. But one thing that, you know, that helps me, you know, is prayer. And, you, you know, you like, like um, um, Ms. Maya said, you know, you have to indulge yourself with the word of God. You know, you have to involve yourself with those things. And Dylan also mentioned, you know, have accountability partners to be there, to be there for you. So you know that, you know, you're weak on certain things. Let them be there for you and to ensure that you're on the right path so that if you seem to derail at times you you have somebody to push you on back i mean you know in this journey yeah you know, even if you could have sexual urges like you could become addicted to porn like we discussed last week as well and that has a lot of effects and we have to know how to to be away from those things as well so i think you know that's it i mean they said it before you know indulge yourself in the word of god and prayer there's nothing too big too small that god will listen to so i think prayer prayer is a big part of my life that helps me to get through that 
All right, great. Thank you, Daniel. Daniel, if you don't mind, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but you can stay on if you want because I know you're a solid young man. The question, if you don't, if you're not okay, if you can't answer a question, that's fine. But I'd be very happy because I feel as if we need another man in terms of support system for Dylan here for having, you know, a man's point of view. So I know Dylan is happy to have you too. And thank you very much for staying on, Daniel. Great. Um, <clears throat> ladies, let, let, talk to me now. Is virginity still relevant in the 21st century? um yes i would say yes definitely it's still relevant you know although i'm thinking about it and although sometimes society makes it look as though it's something that's not raining anymore because you find persons around you and sometimes even in schools you might be students maybe in their classes and you know they they shy to be a virgin because those around them they're not and so then you you would see that they would force themselves into you know becoming you know, losing their virginity so just so to become in the clique of the class or so forth but it's very relevant still god is still there and it is still something it's still an honor because it's something that you would really want to you know experience with your partner when you get married and vice versa same thing for the male all right, great. Thank you very much, Tawina. Uh, I agree with Tawina. I think it is very relevant. Um, I think it's relevant to people who are God-centered. If you are not God-centered, it's probably not relevant to you. You probably want to keep up with the status quo, um, like she mentioned. I mean, I've seen shows on, on television where uh, ladies are literally trying to de-virginize because they want to be in the cool club. You know what I mean? So. Clearly, that kind of person is not God-centered. But when you're God-centered, I mean, why wouldn't it be a big deal to you? You know, so that's what I think. I love that. I love that. I see, Daniel, you're smiling. But the, so I, I want to hear your question, your answer on this. Yeah, I, I, I was listening to it, you know. I mean, I remember back in my time going, going in high school in, in the forest form, like, I had a lot of friends that would say they are proud to be virgins, um, the females, right? And it was something of high status to bear, yeah. right? And now, it, and if a girl went to have sex, she would hide it, and she would be a, she would be ashamed to be calling all those names. But now the tables have turned <laughs> in this century now. Um, you know, you know, it's it's everybody is doing it, so. Sorry about that. And, you know, everybody's doing it. And we see it as like a, a rite of passage to join the cool people. Because mm -hmm. you're not doing it, you're not doing it, um, that means it, it is wrong, right? But it's it's something that you have to do to fit in. That is how the world is. And I would say this, even as a male, you know, around your 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 um your guy friends, it is very hard for a guy to say he's a virgin in this day and age. I would tell you, I, it 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 be it it is an awkward um it is an awkward moment when they ask you that, and sometimes you tend to lie, right, right. But you know, you have to you have to let your morals stand out. It is good to be the odd one, and odd one is not and odd is number one. So you don't not because everybody doing it, that means it's the right thing. So you have to stand up for what you believe, you know. All right. And the then, world the then, world isn't passing you up. The world isn't passing you up. There is gonna be a time for it. I mean, I your that. morals will tell you, your beliefs will tell you that, hey, if I go get this thing now, some people would have that some Christians would have that analytical mind, you know, if I go have this thing now. And I get this girl pregnant. What if I contract a STD? And then your life cut short right there and then. You know, you got to give up your life to start dedicating for another life that is about to come. And, you know, it, it is important that we take these, we think these kind of things before we even go into contemplating having those sex. I mean, they would say it's enjoyable, it's a fun time, but you have to understand the sacredness of sex and under the institution it was ordained. Thank you. I, 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 the point that he made when he said, you're the odd one out and odd is number one. 
I mean, I have never heard that anyway. What a, for me, I felt so uplifted with that statement. So the next time audience, somebody say, oh, you the odd one out, tell them, yeah, it's number one. I, I, I love that. I really love that. Teacher Melinda, are you hearing me? I tell, um, if I get money by God's grace, I want to be the CEO of internet in Guyana. I think I'll be able to make some good money. <laughs> All right, great. Um, so I know her connection is not that well. Okay. Um, so we are talking, we already established, okay, the best sex in terms of marriage and all of those things. Um, what are some consequences? Let's say, oh, if, if because of the fact I can't control my urges and, and it's too much for me, um, what are some possible consequences I may face as a result of um, having premarital sex, not having the best sex within the, the confines of marriage, but I, I, I wanted to fulfill all my desires beforehand. What are some um, disadvantages, uh, some consequences I can face as uh, a result of that? All right, anyone can answer. Well, when I think about the consequences of um, you know, premarital sex, well, we know the, the normal ones, you know, teenage pregnancy and all of the STDs and so on and so forth, but I like us to understand the deep, there's a deep spiritual um, consequence of premarital sex because, you know, in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul talks about that subject and he says that our body is the temple of God. And he says in this 18 that, you know, fornication is the only sin against your own body. So what premarital sex does, it unites you sinfully with another person. And so this happens on a deep, you know, a deep physical and spiritual level. Maybe we not, are not even able to see for this earnest, but it does happen on a deep spiritual level. And so Paul likens our body to the temple. And you know that the temple is where God's presence, his Shekinah glory would dwell. And so when we give ourselves, you know, over to premarital sex to somebody else who is not our husband or our wife, then we could just be trading that sacredness. You understand? That's the kind of the temple. Trading it for the using spirit of devils because we know that when we constantly defile ourselves, that we actually drive in God's presence, she kind of out of the temple. And when the she kind of leaves, then the seducing spirits of devils, they quickly they run in. All right. Paul is not saying that you know um premarital sex is the worst thing, but he's saying that you know it has a unique effect on our body. And the consequences can be physical, moral, and spiritual. And you know, as we was on the you know the, the virgin thing a while ago, I just thinking that there's a there's a theological side towards it too. Because um you know that women when they are virgin, they they have a hymen, right? Mm -hmm. And when you lose your that hymen is ruptured but we should understand why would god give that when we think about the bible you know in theology that that um covenants are ratified by blood yeah and marriage is a covenant you know between a man and a woman in the presence of god and the, the, the ratification of that covenant is supposed to be that hymen that 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 shedding of that blood so when you would have given yourself over to premarital sex then you no longer have that ratification, you know, of the covenant. And you only lose it once because, you know, no matter how much you pray, you can't really get it back. That is one of the deep um, spiritual consequences of the marital sex. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dylan, for sharing that. Great. Um, I would say something that, that stuck with me that someone mentioned to me a while ago back you know, they were saying that, you know, sometimes you you take part into premarital sex and when you enter marriage or maybe you just enter a relationship, but let's say marriage, and then you would find yourself comparing, especially if the person that you entered marriage with is a virgin, then you find yourself comparing, they said, comparing him to him or her to, you know, the different persons that you would have had sex with before. And then it becomes an issue because it may, maybe it may not be 
how you want it to be in your mind or what you were having before and so you find it issues and um it can and these these simple things it lead to big problems in your relationship in your marriage after even so that some persons even divorce because to them they are not getting what they wanted so you know it it really doesn't it's really not nice or it shouldn't be because then you force the person in the other sense you come into it expecting so much but here is the person who kept themselves and then there is this big comparison big arguments within the marriage hmm deep thank you i, I would just like to take a little leverage on what she said just now um that was an excellent contribution i mean in in if you look now these days to what we have what we have what we have going on is that you know people seeing if their future is gonna their relationship with a person is gonna have a future or if it's if it's gonna stand the test of time or whatever it's how well they perform in bed that is how they test their really that their relationship now and when you go into marriage now and one is already experienced and already kept yourself right let's say the woman is not a virgin anymore and the guy is a virgin so they are ready to consummate the marriage now and you know she starts to tell the man that Oh, she can't do it like her ex, and she be feeling five marks early, and all these things, right? I, psychologically, it starts to break the guy's ego and his drive to submit himself to you, and and that is where it has problems, and that is a sad thing that you know we have to validate our relationship with somebody based on how good they were in bed. Hmm. Deep. Oh my goodness. As you know, I'm listening. I'm like, ah. you know, as I listen to several discussions with men and women on this issue of sex, ah, it is so deep. Miss Maya, what do you have to say about that? My thoughts are going all over the place. <laughs> I think uh, another consequence to having premarital sex is that, first of all, you're building the wrong foundation for your marriage. And I think that having sex before marriage gives like a false sense of intimacy. And so you may actually end up marrying the wrong person because you are, you're, you think you're in love with them, but what you're actually in love with is the sex. And so, you know, divorce is a huge consequence because I mean, people don't go into marriage wanting to be divorced. So I guess that would be my contribution among Great. the obvious reasons. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. And um, I want to ask the men, Gregory, I'm so happy that you, you, you were able to make it. Welcome. Um, I want to ask the men Thank this question. You is it, you're welcome. Is it harder for you guys as it relates to um, as it relates to sex, especially in this 21st century? Is it harder for you as compared to women? For the gentleman, any one of you can answer. All right, um, if I may go, I'm sorry to be late. I had power outage, but I'm so happy to be here with you, wonderful people. Um, I believe, in a, to an extent, it is very harder because um, I believe we become addicted towards um, premarital sex because of the fact that when we indulge in it, we want more and so forth. And it becomes much more difficult because we were trained in such a way whereby we were not told to say no. You know, many times you would see parents would um, school a girl and so forth to say no. But sometimes it, it becomes now we are so vulnerable. And it is, it is very rare you would find a guy standing up and so forth. And it, we would receive even more pre-pressure because we want to fit in with our friends. We want to do what they're doing. But for the girl now, they will tend to become more reserved. They're more reserved and so forth. But for the guys, I think that we are more vulnerable, which will pose a more, a more um, challenge. That's it for me. Okay. Thank you. I'm listening from the men's perspective. Thank you. Daniel. Yeah, I think, uh, like Gregory said, you know, we, we sometimes we could, it's more on us to say, you know about this premarital sex situation because it's it's hard for us to say that you know you're a virgin especially 
keeping with the type of friends that you have because you could they would ask you're a virgin you ever had sex before and you start to thinking like you missing something right these guys are ahead of you and when you are wrong your friends it's like this is the one thing that makes you a man right mm. that is the one thing that makes you a man like if you never drink um beers before with the guys if you never been to the strip club you never had sex before that that is it and when and if you say no they start to profile you they will say that he's a little fly and they're thinking you're moving funny right and that is the thing though right and it yeah. takes a toll on on us it could take a toll on us psychologically right it could take a toll on us psychologically while while it's easy to detect in a female if they are virgin or not it it's harder to detect in male if we are virgin or not but socially and psychologically it affects us deeply you know especially around our guy friend because remember this is something that is trending and you want to fit in or you want to be a part of something thank you but daniel uh, you said that it's easy to detect females I, i mean as a woman i don't know if the other ladies you feel the same way i'm wondering how when you say it's easy to detect whether we're virgins or not oh, can no, you explain I, that to I'm us i'm saying what i'm saying what i'm saying um remember women tend or some parents would carry their daughters to the hospital to okay. check to check their hymen or so there i i i don't i never heard or come across of any um procedure medically that you know parents scared the son to find out if they are you know like that okay okay great great thank yeah. you thank you for clarifying that thank you delon i think i mean as you were speaking i just think about the fact that you know in the world the mindset would be that a girl would be proud to know that society knows that she's a virgin you understand but a man in the other other hand would be proud that people know that he's not <laughs> you understand so um you know when i think about that i think about you know what even when i used to be you know back at my previous work i used to be in the back room and we have to make like you know 24 hour shifts and then we went in a big back room with men only you know what their conversations and everything is going to be and it's not really men that you know go, we don't, you know we don't, we don't go to the same church and stuff like that so you know what the conversations are normally about and you know women and women and this and you know some women even come you know to the back room and stuff like that but um you know they would constantly be behind you you know you know let's do this let's do that you know you have to be a man you know so there's constant you know per pressure but i'm um, to the grace of god i I survived. <laughs> you survived. <laughs> All right, great. I I remember um in secondary school how these guys used to lie that they're that they're having sex and you know some of them would be like, why I went um I went and I did with this girl and that girl and I can remember one of my male friend and then looked at him and I was like, boy, are you having sex with truth? He looked at me and said, should be kicking represent as a man. I never had sex. What <laughs> I am among them. I gotta say. <laughs> I you know from since then I learned that okay many times men will say that okay they they um they're not virgins they're sexually active it's not may, it may not necessarily be the truth but because of the fact they want to prove themselves a man you know and with the egos and everything Miss Maya what do you think the guys would have said is easy in terms of um it's harder for them as men from a woman's um perspective now what do you think it's it's harder it's easier for us I mean for, in my opinion yeah I mean I think that obviously you have women who are sexual addicts right yeah. but I think on a very good day a woman can abstain from sex I mean you have women who you know their husbands get arrested and go to jail for 5 years or 3 years and they don't have sex I mean they just you know keep themselves or even women who their husbands die at the age of 40 and they never remarry and they're not they don't have boyfriends you know so i think women it's easier for women to abstain from sex i don't know why but i just think that it is you know i think men are just like you know um energizer bunnies they just they're always thinking about sex whereas a woman i can speak for myself i can go a whole week and not really think about sex because i have so much so many other things i'm thinking about you know someone has to really bring it up or you see it on television but i don't wake up like thinking oh my god you know i need to have sex whereas i think men do i think it's very hard for men to abstain especially when they've had already and i think um i love your submission and i think we have the reminder morning times too 
we don't necessarily have that reminder so it's like yeah boy i mean delon delon you give that side smile there <laughs> and Danny, <laughs> all right so we know what you think about that question that i asked before <laughs> Yeah, I would agree with Maya. I would say that, yeah, it's it's to be honest, women, sometimes we have so, like she said, we have so much things to do. And it's like, you don't really have time to really just stay there and think about it because you might be planning some kind of things to do. And the sad thing is sometimes even in your small group, um, I mean, there are women who would be thinking about that, but they, most times, you know, other women, they might be finding themselves maybe talking about something else, maybe talking about a hairstyle or this new thing. So it's not really something that they would sit and say, you know, or go by the bar to talk about, or, you know. So I think it's a bit easier on the women opposed to what's the men. All right, great. Thank you so much. All right, I just want to say thanks to Miss Maya. For those of you who join us late, she's an attorney at law. She originally, well, her parents are from Nigeria, but she's a born, she's an American. And um, I happened to meet her on Facebook and I knew that she would have been an excellent candidate for the panel's afternoon. But of course she has a show also and she has so many different things she's doing. So she has to take her leave now, but we're gonna continue. We just have a few more questions. So Miss Maya, it was such a great pleasure meeting you officially. Thank you. Thank yes. you for having me. It was a pleasure. And I hope that one another day I can have you on the program again. Yeah, definitely. All right, Thank God you. God. bye everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right, great. So Miss Maya is off. Um so hi miss uh genevieve um and we have um anuri i hope i'm pronouncing your name correct correctly um sister girl they said women has the strength and reserves and know where and how to direct their energies hmm. yep but of course we know all women are not the same eh? so we have um different um different explanations will be given there all right i want to know in terms of an, an, any member from the audience remember the link is in the chat if you feel free you want to join to give a comment on a question you can do so but um you know there is this concept i don't know daniel i know i put you on the spot you were not officially scheduled to be on program today but i don't know if you heard about the concept of sex demons where people will talk you know when they're doing sexual presentations they will say if you have sex with several persons you know you can um you can end up having sex demons and all of those things. Can any one of you clarify that concept to us today? What your understanding may be of it? Um, okay, so from in the Bible, um, sex is men mentioned as a spiritual, a spiritual something, right? Yeah. And that is why, and that is a study was done in it, and they say that you know that is why when women or so have have sex with multiple partners, right? A sample of that guy's um, genetic being remains with them, right? And that is how, in the long run, when you're ready to have a child, right, that is that child could eventually become affected. And it won't even be because of the current child part, because it, it could be of past experiences. I listened to a sermon from Miles Monroe a few, a few years back, mm -hmm. and he was saying, you know, you know, because the guy has. And this, this question that you asked would vary as in gender. So okay. he would say the women would say, you know, you got a sex demon. Early in the morning you want sex. Um, in the night you want sex. And, and, and all kinds of things, right? And you, and you can't just get off your mind. But what we got to understand is that this sex is a part of a man's mind. Majorly. If you see, if you Google the mind of a man and woman, you would see sex is majorly at, at that creative part of his mind that is, that is yes sex that is that is that is what drives him that is what and the man is a hunter by nature he's a procreator by nature so he's always out there so you can't tell a man he's, he got a demon right if you want to say younger self-control as to when and where you have sex fine but you know, as to tell them the guy you got a D one, I don't I don't agree with it. I mean it, it is a part of it, especially when we're talking in the marriage, the marriage arena. You can't tell the guy you get you got a D one. It it is just I just say it's wrong because it is a part of him. It is a need and a need is something that is a necessity to you for your existence. Right? It is a part of you. You can't you can't take that away from you, right? But as it concerns, I would if I would agree with somebody to say that you got no self-control where it comes to when, as to where 
you want to have sex, that is that is the only concern I would have. But you know, as the demon, I will say that when it comes to a guy. Hmm. All right. Thank you so much, Daniel. All right, teacher Melinda. All right. So same internet. You hearing me? All right. Let's just hope. All right. Great. Um, Dylan, go right ahead. When I think about the sex demon thing, I think about, you know, Mary in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Because the Bible says that Mary, you know, she was whom Jesus would have cast out seven demons. And when you do the background on Mary, you know, she was called Mary Magdalene because she had that quote unquote prostitute house in Magdala, the place called Magdala. Yeah. So there where she had that house, you know, where she would be, you know, taking these multiple men. And then Jesus would have to cast out seven demons out of her. So I'm thinking, would these demons actually be sex demons that she had? Who thought? I don't know. I've never studied it in that context. Because there's there's also been debate as to um to whether or not in terms of okay, yeah, the Bible mentioned about demons. Um, how many demons? There have been a whole lot of debates around then Mary Magdalene. Some people say she was not a prostitute, right? Um, so it's like <laughs> depends upon the scholar and who would have examined her, you will hear different findings about that. But continue your discourse. Right. And you know, somebody else was sharing with me that um, you know, when you like when you fall so much into lust, when you saturate your mind so much in that it is a like a field of where just sex you are just constantly rain, you understand? You see that when you when you sleep, you think that you know maybe you're dreaming about sex, but it's not that you're dreaming, is that a sexual demon is actually troubling you because your mind is so saturated with these thoughts that you kind of allow these demons to come in and settle within you. And as a result, they actually attack you. But I'm not sure how much truth there is to these stories. But we know that um, when you make yourself, as I said before, that when you would have you know, given yourself to premarital sex and you would have um, allowed seducing spirit of devils to come in, who knows? Maybe demons, sex demons would have come in as well because of you know the multiple partners that you would have had. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Tobina? Um, I would say I agree. Um, so I was kind of thinking along the line that Dylan was thinking along the line. You know, sometimes when persons allow themselves to really be filled with the sexual things, you know, there's a difference when, okay, it just happens because of nature. And then there's a difference when you actually feast upon these things. So you wake up every day and you, you just... And the thing is, sometimes you do it willingly and then sometimes it just happens. But when you do it willingly, you allow these things to get to your mind and then you act upon it. So it comes to an extent where you have like no control or you have an addiction towards mm -hmm. sex. You start to begin to have an addiction towards it. You cannot control yourself. I mean, when you see different persons passing, different guys or females passing by, or they may say one little thing to you, one little line, and you fall for it one time because you feast your mind so much on these sexual things that you know, you know, you have an addiction towards it. So I would say in an essence that, you know, like sex demons would be like, you know, when you feast yourself so much upon it, that you're so easy to fall for sexual things because it's basically like, it's really taking control of your life because, you know, like you know like when a demon in you like it takes fully control over you so you can't really control yourself in that arena so that's that's what i would say about it all right okay greg do you have anything to any light to share on that well i'm um, concerning that um i would say that it it usually come because of um our lustful desire for um sex and so forth all of these things can harnish um, demons or entertain demons and um, when persons would um let us stray with um all kinds of things pornography and so forth we create the environment for evil spirit to step in and um also some persons would be involved in these things because of the rituals and cults and so forth whereby they summon demons and all of these things 
and many poets would have shared experience concerning these things they would testify about being harassed by demonic spirits or being aware by demonic spirits. But I would say it usually come because of um, a lustful desire for sex and the way persons would entertain certain things around. All right, great. And uh, it reminds me of a story I heard a man, he was doing a presentation on sex demons and, and um, he was so passionate about the topic. And he would have alluded to the fact that, okay, having many sexual partners, and one of the things he would have said is that in his life, he had so many, I can't remember how many sexual partners he had. He used, because he was a man, he just used to go on having sex with women because he feel that's what a man's supposed to be doing. And because of that, it's like he said, he's in bed, let's say with Jenny, and he's thinking about Shirley. And it's like, there is no time he actually, in um, having sex, he actually had sex with that person in particular because he's always constantly thinking about another person while he's having sex. So he would have concluded that a part of that person basically remains in you because of the fact sex is, um, sex is a covenant, is a spiritual covenant. We know that there is blood and all of those things attached to that, as Dylan would have explained earlier, especially if the woman is a virgin. There is a form of attachment that happens. So what he found himself, have, well, eventually, I'm not certain if he was a Christian during that time or not, but he found himself so trapped and so spellbound that when he got married, his marriage was not a happy marriage because he could have never experienced proper sexual intimacy with his wife because of these so many different women that are tied up in his head, wrapped around, as he called them, sex demons within him. So one of the things he had to do, he had to call, try and trace back all of those women get their telephone numbers because he was praying because he had to break the habit and he wanted whatever was in him um, to leave. He had to literally beg these women for forgiveness. He had to call, he said some of them he were able to meet in person, but some of them he, he had to search whether on Facebook or social media, somewhere or the other, just to get their contact information for just to say he is sorry. And he said it's until like when he sincerely apologized and true prayers and everything, he recognized that the burden started relieving one by one, one by one, one by one. And he started feeling, literally he started feeling lighter. So because of that, he it became like a passionate presentation for him. And he would go around telling people, especially telling our young men, not to feel as if because of the fact that everybody is doing it, that means that you're supposed to be doing it. But the fact that because how God would have created sex as a covenant, we have, as young men especially, have to be very, very careful. And young women are not exempted from that. It can also happen to women also. So it's, it's, a, it's a subject in which we have to be careful. And remember, if we want to have the best sex, folks, let us just wait until we are married. I have two more questions to explore before we take our leave. Um, so what I want to know, uh, panelists, in terms of um, what would you advise young men and women who think they have to test the waters before they marry? What would you advise the young men and women who want to test the water? Because I have been in conversation with men that said, then, excuse me, they're not going to marry a woman unless they have sex with him, sex with her. They want to know that, okay, I don't know if she's, I don't know my term sexable or what, but they have to test the waters before they marry. What would you advise young people who have that sort of notion as it relates to sex before marriage? Well, um, what I was going to say, you know, as you were saying that, I think that, you know, this, this is a very popular theory, you know, between, you know, young people say it, adult people say it, a lot of people believe in that theory and to be really honest when you come to think of it it would make sense to a secular mind because you know in the world of business who buys a product without testing it who hmm. invest too much in something without testing it i mean there could be defects and when it comes to the marriage you know the man could be dysfunction you know so he could there could be defects so there's good reason to a secular mind to believe in that theory but on the deeper side of things, we have to understand that, you know, marriage and sex and all these things are of God. So they are spiritual and spiritual things are to be spiritually discerned. That's right. So we cannot right. apply the standards of the world or we cannot use what the world think 
to measure or to apply to a sacred institution of God. All right, we ought to use what God says as his standard when we are looking at sacred institutions that he would have created. So my advice would be, you know what, this is a spiritual thing. And as a result, we cannot take the advice of the world on it. We have to take the advice of God on it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Basil. You know, I was I was listening as to what he was saying, and you know that's true. Sometimes, you know, when you go into the worldly things that you always test before, but then something ran through my mind. You know, sometimes have you ever been in a situation where you're going to this expensive store? And then they don't have no testing. It's either you buy it or you don't buy it. And I'm just, there, I'm just there thinking that if you value your partner that much, then you will wait. Like the expensive things in the store, you will wait until marriage to have sex with them. But, you know, God said to trust in him. And he created sex. Man didn't create sex. So if God says to trust him, I believe that we should trust him to know enough that um, sex is only going to be the best in marriage. And it shouldn't be a way of testing. A lot of times I did hear that as well. And persons would say, if I can't have sex with you, I will not marry you. So then, I mean, if persons you are faced with this, then that's your cue. That's not the person for you because the person, the person who is for you, he's gonna value you and he's gonna wait until marriage to have sex with you. So if they want to test the waters, then that's that's God giving you your cue one time. He he's not worth it for you. <laughs> Get away, run, ladies, run. If you are a man, be a Joseph and run. <laughs> yeah, Daniel. <laughs> yeah. So I like the analogy that she gave yes, that you, know, you compare you compare these high-end vehicles and the not so high-end ones. So yes, with a Toyota car, they might allow you to drive it. Now, if you go to Bugatti and Mercedes, you can't drive all these people, things like that. They know the value of it, right? And once you know the value of something, you know the price that was put on it, you're gonna wait. Um a lot of guys would drive this car and you want to test it to see if it's still running, if the engine still tune up good and thing. Right? And you want to test that for yourself. And like I said, this is how people want to validate the future of their um their relationship. They want to decide how good one of them was in bed. And that's how they're gonna think. But for me, there are other ways to be intimate. There you could be intimate physically, uh socially psychologically know what's on this person's mind where they want to be because there's going to come a time where um sex won't even excite you anymore when you have all these responsibilities you know eventually when you have children and so and then when sex comes around once in a while it, it's like it's going to be like a luxury for you right but you know after a time Sex doesn't pay it. And if you're going to be married on the sex, on the basis or the foundation of just having sex, it, it, it won't last because there are other things to test. There are other waters to test before you go in. Because, I mean, sex is not the only water you got to test. <laughs> you got to see what this person is thinking. You got to know what are their goals, what are their ambitions, what, what they have for you in the future. Because if, you know, it comes a time that I can't function or you or you can't function, that is not gonna take us to a marriage. Right? Because we are getting old every day. We're not gonna be this young and attractive anymore when the skin starts to get frail and and we can't get those those morning joys and those things anymore. That's not gonna be it. So we have to think long term. So like I said, there's other waters to test and like um, Ms. Williams said, you know the value of something. Just always think about the car. You know the value of it. And if you know some, but this goes for any relationship from um, mutually male and female. As long as, you know, if somebody respects your views that, hey, I'm going to wait until marriage and so, you have to respect that and, and that is the person. Rather, if they go otherwise, cut and run. Yeah. Daniel, you know, if you 
if if you weren't if i didn't know you were single in the sense of not being married i would have said daniel is a married man is a married man speaking to us right now song and let me to those who are viewing i want to oh by the way i want to ask you to share this broadcast to your page right now take the opportunity and do it but i want to say also that daniel was not supposed to be part of this panel today but that that is to say how he's a song the young man i know i could have trusted him to put him on the spot bring him on the panel and i know he would have delivered effectively um daniel i am so proud of you boy i wish you the best when you're ready to get married i know that young lady she would not be disappointed providing that you allow god to keep you with that same mindset eh? you will go far away of course we know delon is a yes. son and delon don't get um jealous in any way you know <laughs> but i love i'm proud of our young men that are represented here i want to um yeah. yakima make a come yak yakima oh made a very important comment here she was talking about dylan's point where um he was using product of the world they're made by human hands and can be defective but our bodies and sex by god's design are made by god's hand god does not make mistakes i'm happy that all the girlfriends are listening in and um the boyfriends are listening i'm so happy what a wonderful program this afternoon is and um i love the fact um chosen asks a very pertinent question here i think we, we need to address because it's one of my hot topics that i love when it comes to sex i think this is one of the questions i always ask people um i don't know how come i forgot to mention it in the in the thing but I, i'm happy it came from a viewer and it's she says what do you say to couples who waited to have sex especially my people in the audience i need your comments here what do you say to couples who waited to have sex after marriage but divorce shortly after marriage because of challenges encountered in their sex life i know you guys could only talk from a single perspective because you're not yet married but let me hear your comment if there's anybody married person in the audience um you want to give the comment or even if you're single and you want to add to what you think can be the answer to this question i'll be very very happy and grateful just connect to the link and feel free to join this broadcast right now yes what do you say to couples in this situation i'm gonna give my bit on it after guys you guys are finished talking okay well i could only speak from sadly i can only speak from a um, single point of view but what i can say though is that um and that's that's a really really good question it's a question that a lot of people ask because then we tell persons you know basically they shouldn't really test the waters they should wait so then when they wait what happens but you know when we when persons approach that i believe you know like they would have been waiting and stuff that you should involve god in it you shouldn't go into it with self even though you are married yes you are married to that individual still you need to include god into it and there shouldn't be a point where it's a selfish part so that i mean i'm not sometimes maybe cases may be that because it's because one partner may be selfish towards the other partner and timings and so forth now i can't really go deep into it because i'm not sure as to what but what i can say is that sometimes mm -hmm. the simple things are what persons make big issues into it most times sometimes that could have been fixed maybe self should have been thrown out of the way to accommodate the other person so all these things should be taken into consideration all right great so so mm -hmm. to our viewers you've seen the question on the um on the stream right now um it's there what do you say to couples who waited to have sex after marriage but divorced shortly after marriage because of challenges in continuing sex life and she has another counter question there she said or to singles who use this argument to test the water let me hear you gentlemen i mean none of you guys um, are married but let me hear your comment on it well my my views on this uh this is what we were discussing just now uh don't get married on the foundation of just to have sex right because it won't last like mm. i said there are other things that are more important than sex in a marriage yes sex is important and, and i'm not saying um you're not gonna have sex in your marriage that is a must we can't avoid that right because we owe we owe ourselves to each other once we would have made our vows in our marriage 
But if we're going to judge on the performance of how each other would have functioned, no, you're going to get married. You're, you're going to get divorced because uh, he couldn't make you climax or, you know, she's not making the songs or what's not or she cannot make a or she can't make a child you you shouldn't get upset to that that is for me that is being immature about that and there are a lot of other things you need to focus on on building a marriage because at the end of the day in any relationship sex won't build your house that you want sex won't give you the money that you need right so and sex won't bring the morals that you want for your child to have and, and all of that. There are other things to focus on. And even when it comes to single, when you say that, oh, you have to test the waters, right? Um, every woman, every man, especially women too, right? Because they are the ones that are, are easily persuaded or vulnerable to having sex in, in this day and age. Right, so they are know your worth, and as long as you know your worth and you could stand up for it, you have your morals. Don't let anybody come, come raining on your career just like that. You know, take your time, take your time to date, be intentional, know what you want, and achieve what you want. All right, but I want to I wanna go deeper to this question, Daniel. I, I heard you, um, great submission, and for the other persons who will yet to speak. I want to say in let's say if the problem is impotency. So let me let me let me rephrase chosen. Permit me please to rephrase your question or to put in my bit of it. So the sex problem here is I waited until I'm married and to have sex. But when I have sex, I realize that my partner is impotent. Right? Cannot function. What should I do? In a situation like that so i'm just I'm, I'm going deeper it's not just oh position sex it's not just song sex it's not just you know those kind of frivolous excuses that we can get by i am talking now the man cannot perform what should we advise somebody in that situation i don't know if any my person the odd in the audience feel free to join this panel if this particular question because i know a lot of young people use it and they because of the fact that they think that they they always afraid that they may end up in that situation so they want to prefer they prefer to test the waters before so let me hear dylan what do you have to say about that well i think um the the man should be honest and to submit that to to the person who's going to marry before they marry or at least they should have spent enough time together for them to have at least discuss that because I believe that when you go to the proper counseling, that all these things should should surface and they should be discussed. But if the man was, if he if he did that, then he proved to be dishonest. All right. And um, I kind of like what she said. The root of it all is, you know, selfishness. Yeah, you know, like one partner being selfish towards mm -hmm. another, and that mm -hmm. is basically the root of all this problem right there. It is selfishness. Okay, so your view is that there should have been, there should be a discussion beforehand. Hi, Tiana, welcome. Right, Go right. Up. And I know, um, I know in these days, like couples, you know, they like people a lot more serious these days. You know, they go through all these kind of a test before they they get married because you know yeah. there's this far-fetched notion that um maybe if your your DNA is not compatible with this one, that or you'll not be able to have a child. So you know, mm -hmm. persons take the opportunity to test all these things. You know, go through all these tests. You know, to the doctors and everything before they get married these days because you know we have a lot of technology in the world today and so let's just use it great um so Charmaine, welcome I, I i i saw your comment there would you be is would it be okay for you to join the stream i know you're married uh you made a very very important comment here but i think maybe the audience will need a little more information on it um if you're willing could you just please join the stream um here so Charmin says sex is just a small part of marriage and there are things that the man can use to improve his potency so Charmin, if you're willing please join while we take daniel's comment daniel go right ahead your microphone is muted sorry like like what dylan said all this should be 
mentioned at the 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 marriage counseling the like the before you get married the counseling and you know if if this is your flaw or so you 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 have a you don't have the capacity to hold up that that erection or or what's not it, it should be done because not on the night or so it, it comes as a surprise to her and even right so and even in there are ways to to combat that issue as well. I mean, there are natural remedies or, you know, there are medications that could help them with that to help to help him function for a couple of hours until that. So they have, you know, they have things, they said it's, they have granite backbone and all these things, right? And the Viagra and what's not to help him with that. But like, the, I think the most important thing is that that communication, that, because some of us would go into a relationship and say that I want, like, they really have to get a child, right? They want, especially the woman, she would want to have that child or the or so. So I think if you know to yourself that you can do that or what's not, it, it should be, it should be communicated. So the communication before that, that is happening is, is very important. So we're hearing the one, one big point resounding communication communication Tawina, as a woman and i'm gonna give my point of view I, I i listened to the ladies comments there and then andre would have given his comments but Tawina, as a woman what would you do in a situation like that okay so before i answer what i would do let me just say you know um what they said was really 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 important at the end of the day this should be something discussed before i like what daniel said because you don't want to this to catch you at a surprise. I mean, it's going to be hard for the female. And then then they realize at the end of the day, you're stuck in this because it's better or for worse. So I think it should be something. So what I will do, like this is a discussion that's supposed to happen before so that you as an individual, you get the choice to choose whether or not, hey, I'm in love with you. And so I'm not going to allow because persons are different. So maybe that may not be the main thing for me. So I may say, OK, I still love you. I will go through marriage with it. Where on, on the other hand, with somebody else, it may be a big issue for them. And so, I mean, it will be best for them to end the relationship there early o'clock instead of going into marriage and then they're stuck in it and end up, I mean, sadly ending divorce or so forth because i mean you want to be safe at first at the end of the day if you love your partner as well you would be open to them tell them everything i mean if you guys are so open to each other which you should be before marriage so that you know you know what you're getting into because you don't want to get into a surprise and then you cannot deal with it and then problems start to occur hmm. all right well my Okay, Daniel, you have a point to make. Go ahead. Yes, sorry about that. Um, but okay. you know, I mean, sometimes as guys, I mean, some of us, if we know we have this kind of problem, right, we would tend to be ashamed of it. Exactly. That I, I don't want to see it. But it, you know, remember when you're going into marriage, you are going into the rest of your life, right? You are going to share a life with somebody else, and you have to be transparent with them. That is very important. And you have to be comfortable enough to tell them what is going on. Because if you know it's going to affect her, you know, in the long run, you're going to have severe trust issues. And, you know, you're going to start thinking that, oh, you can't function. And you start building up trust problems now. And you said that, oh, even in the marriage, she got looking wrong, forget that satisfaction. Right? So... It is very important that even if you know that you're ashamed of it, I mean, eventually somebody has to know. I mean, it, if, it, if you don't want nobody else to know, your wife-to-be has to know about it. Hmm. All right. Great. Um, so I just want to just zero in on some of these comments. Um, Makima said, first of all, um, it's, a, it's a sexual health issue. Um, person should be very open and honest exactly. Uh, consultation with a doctor could address impotence. If not, the partner has to decide whether there's a compromise they're willing to make or not. That's the big point of it. Um, Andre says, okay, you were talking about the discussion in church, but then then Tappy made a point. Once you would have made a vow, all of those areas should have been covered medically. 
it's her personal view listen people anyway let me read and then i got to him. <laughs> um <laughs> Andres says, um, in terms of the impotence and erectile dif um, dysfunction, it is possible this offered after marriage and it could be medical, oh, occur after marriage and it could be medical problems, side effects of medications used or lifestyle or emotional disorders can be fixed. This should not be the reason a relationship ends. Hmm. So Genevieve is making a comment here. Um, she's a married woman. She couldn't walk for, she, I could have or couldn't okay could, gotta be couldn't walk for three months have public synthesis for years please don't say sex is just a, a, a small part but putting god forces is a blessing he heals in more ways we can think and communication as said is important talk to the doctor support guys hmm but if you do not know you get married then you find out that is my that is the main point of my question here that ashiba would have asked there so for me personally, um, I think Andre's on the chat. Okay, so I'm gonna invite Dr. Hada just before I give my personal view. I'll invite Dr. Um Hedar is here. He's gonna explain to us from the medical point of view. Um, so let's hear what he has to say on this issue. Greetings, Dr. Hedar. Welcome. Hello, hello everyone. Hi, Pastor Shibiki. Uh, hello to the listeners. Good afternoon. I just, I'm not here to stay. I'm just here to quickly weigh in on the medical aspects of impotence or erectile dysfunction. Um, you know, it as I was sitting there listening, I think, um, and I say it boldly, that it would be selfish of someone to leave um, or end a relationship because their partner might be having some problems with getting a stand or what we call impotence or erectile dysfunction. Um, Time and time again, I hear the panelists echoing that that's not necessarily the, the, main, um, the main purpose of getting into a relationship. Anyways, just weighing in on uh, why you shouldn't leave is because it's a problem that can be fixed in most cases. Um, when we look at erectile dysfunction, we see that it can be a major health issue. It can be caused by many many um conditions one of those conditions being diabetes if you take a census or you do a study on diabetes in the population you'd notice that it affects so many males within the middle age category um this is the prime of their lives when they're supposed to be functioning at their best but what happens is when you have diabetes you have problems with nerves so you get some nerve damage and this can cause the loss of sensation of mm. course um leading to you um not being able to get a, a rise uh the other problems that um can cause this would be um any surgeries uh maybe um that would have uh been done on the prostate this don't necessarily affect um the rise you get but it affects definitely the amount of ejaculate that comes out because some of the ejaculate is made up of uh, fluid that is dispensed from the prostate um, which can lead to problems in marriages too uh, or impotence um, the other problems will be things like uh, emotional or um, emotional problems uh, sometimes what a man suffers from is uh, anxiety right before having sex he wonders if he's going to be enough he second guesses himself and this can lead to um, the brain sending messages of course and not being able to overcome the fear that he has and subsequently he won't be able to get a rise uh, all of these can be fixed um, so it's not a reason to leave a relationship definitely not so so Doug, before you, can... you go before you go so supposing now i am in this relationship and this guy never says that to me we made a plan that we're going to have sex before marriage so we're not really involved in touches and all of those things because we made a decision but then this guy he knew he had a problem and then on our wedding night i'm going to discover that what should i do doc in that situation you know um that's a tough question, but to give my input on that, uh, what I want to say is that men 
men are visual beings. We can never underestimate the power of what God can do in any relationship or in any um, being for that matter. Uh, you just have to believe that God can do all things, right? Um, and because men are visual beings, the wife uh, wants to ensure that she uses tactics and ways, uses different avenues um, to try to excite her husband. This is a this is not to say that he shouldn't be trying, but um, this is to say that it's a collective effort. Uh, don't give up. Just keep pressing and trying. If one one way don't work, try the next way the next time. I see you're 100% defending men. That's all right. I wonder if I had a female doctor on the platform, what she would have said <laughs> about this. Because uh, for me, I don't like deception. And you, we start in our marriage there on deception because we, it was never discussed before. Um, Honestly speaking on that matter, I can remember at one point in school. Doc, if you want, you can leave. Thank you so much for your contribution. But I can't um, remember. Just before I leave, Pastor Shibiki. Yeah. Um, sometimes, most times, um, especially those for those men who have been waiting for marriage, they're not aware of these problems. But we do have some who are aware and they, they're scared to discuss or they feel like their manlyhood is threatened if they discuss yeah. these problems. However, just waning on the issue that I believe the person's name is Chance, is it? There's a sister yeah, that asked chosen. the question earlier. Chosen. Mm -hmm. um, chosen. Uh, and she was saying, um, before the whole issue of impotence and so came up, she was asking if somebody uh, waits until sex and then they realize they don't like it after they get into the marriage and they leave. I was in church. I shared it in the comments, but I was in church once. And um, this 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 same question came up. And just before I leave, I'd like to share what was the end point of it. Pastor Braffitt was there uh, taking the discussion through. And you know what he said is the male is waiting and the female is waiting. And if they both wait and they both hit it off, whenever they feel like if it's the wedding night or whatever, then what the male does is all the female knows. And what the female does is all the male knows. So there's no, there's nothing to compare it to. And because there's nothing to compare it to, that is their normal. So that yeah. is what they're accustomed to. If Jane does it this way, that's all Peter knows. That's all, that's all he will know, how Jane does it. So that will be his normal and it's very important. Um, because this will help them to not know what they're missing or what they're lacking, right? Yes. That's providing that both of those individuals are virgins. Definitely. Anyways, yeah. have a good afternoon. I'll take care. Thank you, Doc. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for your submission. All right. So I was saying that um, I can remember we had a program on the dormitory. I don't know if Tawina, you remember that, but we were talking about the same matter of impotence and everything. And the question came up. And for me, I cannot fathom in my in my mind how can a man lie to me about something like that, especially a woman who is waiting to have sex, and you're not going to tell me that, especially if you knew me. I'm not talking that you did not know, but you knew it, and you're using not having sex before marriage as a covering because of the fact you're hoping that the matter be solved privately before our wedding. And then for me to discover that on my wedding night, I am not saying, trust me, theologically or not theologically, I don't know how I'm going to take that, but it's a difficult situation to weigh in on, especially knowing the fact that my marriage started with such a big deal of um, deception as Genevieve saying, Genevieve made a point to say, don't say that sex is not a big part. Listen, for almost anybody who never had sex before and that's the first time in their marriage, sex is a big thing for them on that particular time right so it may not it may be easy for somebody to say who had sexual experiences before now nah, it's not a big deal but for for some for both parties who are waiting it's like the biggest deal right so um <clears throat> i wouldn't say publicly what i will do on this forum it's a public forum but i i don't think i could just go and say okay lord jesus just help me in this it would be a difficult thing there's some crucial de decisions that will have to be made but it may not be the easiest thing to make at a point. So tenderness is saying be easy on the men, please. But all I'm saying, men, it's important for us to have the discussion. We ladies like to listen. And we would listen. And if we love you, we are going to go through the process with you. We are going to see doctors with you. Most times before we marry, of course. But 
don't deceive us or else you may not you may be you may see um the different side of us daniel i know you origin to give a comment go give a comment before we take our last question <laughs> yes um i mean doc, dr andre he he mentioned a lot of things and, and it's so true and he came from both sides of defense defense yeah. um catering that that you know the guy may know and he may not know and he gave reasons why and that was very excellent and you know i was thinking at the same time you know like like you said like you know sometimes they may know but they may not talk because it's how they see themselves and they're not comfortable with letting out that side of their life like that right even though as much as i trust you with a whole lot of things like this side of me i i'm so ashamed to talk about it that destroy that will destroy your manhood daniel Come on, if I decide, <laughs> right. listen, if many people don't know that, but if I decide because my marriage is not consummated, we have not have sex. If I decide to carry that marriage in annulment and everybody recognize after the first day we marry, next day you hear that Shibiki and X separated. And because the marriage oh. went in annulment, I am legally, by, I don't, I can marry back without any, without the law telling me anything within that three days period. So if I go there, you know that's a bigger hit on your ego for your friends. You know, that that's the reason why your wife left. Yeah, you. that that is a, that is a bigger hit, right? right but yeah, this yeah. is uh, one, one one thing that Dr. Andrew mentioned, and and you know, help me to see this side of it. Is like if you recall, uh, the woman was sent to the man as a help, and she has to help the man. And I like how you mentioned. Yes, we're going to go to the doctor and we're going to see you through and to ensure that you overcome this problem. Maybe just a little something that we have to tap into for him to just get his thing. Like this guy has the drive, but he just got to get something to start up that engine going, right? It okay. might not be something genetically or psychologically, but the woman got to help the man. But before we go and get that professional help, Dr. Andrew said, men are stimulated or turned on by what they see. They are visual beings. So... The woman got to do what she got to do inside the room and to help the man, right? And I think that is a form of help for him. And I mean, well, you know, you can make your decision after you don't do what you, you got to do and he still didn't get something, then you got you to gotta come around with another procedure. But there's a lot of ways to work around it before giving up, you know? But I would say that there is a deception if the guy knows and he doesn't want to talk about it. It, it, it could cause problems on the night as well. Uh, something that, that could be deceiving to a guy as well, if the woman does this, is, you know, this guy, he's looking for a woman that has never had sex before, right? Yep. She is a virgin. He's looking for that person and he's big on spirituality and he wants both on your wedding night that is your gift to one another, right? You're, you know, consummating that marriage. And now, then you're going to find out that, you know, this girl is not a virgin. And and on, and on now, she will just lean you along to, to say that she's this good woman and she's virtuous. And, you know, back then she, she, she did her stuff. And now, and I, I, I have a lot of friends that say this thing, you know, the virginity grow back and all kind of thing, right? But I you know if you know you're not a virgin, so just be straight, just be yeah. straight with us, totally. you know. Let us let us be honest from both sides of the fence. Like there's nothing to to hide when you're saying that you're not a virgin because it is a talk that is every day. So there should be clarity, there should be transparency with each other when we're talking. So. When it comes to about this deception thing or talking if we have this problem or not, it goes both ways. And, you know, we should be able to support each other to make things work like that. All right, great. Thank you. So we have about 10 minutes remaining, but Jay asks a very important question here. Um, let me... Um, his question is, so if the problem can't be corrected, would you continue with marrying him if you claim you love him? I don't know, Jay. I don't know if that question is directly for me or who, or if it's this. This seems like if directly to us women, if the problem can be. So we talk about okay, maybe we knew and we're trying different things, but then the problem can't be corrected. I don't know, if Dr. Andre, if there's a problem that it can't be corrected. But I know Dr. Andre spoke about diabetes. So this man got diabetes, and maybe let's see, he didn't know, and the problem is nerves start going, really going, 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 and it can't be corrected. Would you continue with marrying him if you claim you love him? Women, 
ladies, too, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if your fiance is still looking. Um, um uh, okay, so the thing is hmm, that's 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 that that's a big one there. But the, the truth is, um now <laughs> I will speak from a general point of view when some people may think. But the truth is, at the end of the day, no, some people really, and like Shibiki, like you would have said, and which is true, at the end of the day, when you're keeping yourself and your virgin, and it, sex is really indeed a big thing. And I mean, on the night you really want to go, you want to enjoy. So, I mean, there still have different persons out there. And I say, I say this again. So there are persons who, it's not to say that sex is not a big thing to them. It's just that they are more willing to compromise, I should say. So it's, they're more willing to compromise. Now, at the end of the day, I may not be willing to compromise. I This thing is big for me, so I may go beyond the ends of this earth, maybe, to look for a solution to, you know, to work this thing out. But in the case, let's answer the question, in the case that it cannot be corrected. Now, the thing is, it's a tough one. The individual will have to decide at the end of the day if, I mean, to be honest, I'm speaking here right now, and I really, I mean, I really don't know what I would do. Honestly, like, I mean, I'm being honest. If I'm faced, if I'm faced with that situation, I mean that I mean, it is a big thing for me. So I mean, I don't know. At the end of the day, if I go into marriage and that happen, I'm not saying it's gonna happen. But if it happens, then I'm there already. But I mean, yeah. So it's up to the individual to decide. Hey, I'm not going to allow this to be the biggest part of my life, of my marriage. So I'm willing to work with you. I'm willing to work with you to the extent where maybe something else will work out. So I will make it a big deal. So I'm going to go in with you because I love you. And so I say it depends on the persons. They have to decide. I can tell how the person thinking. I can say how they're deciding. It's really an individual thing for the person to really decide. They know their relationship. They know what they're into. If this sex thing is really um, big in their relationship or it's not that big in their relationship, I cannot say. I could only speak for maybe mine. But I can't really say how easy the person to really decide. Hey, I love you that John. I love you that much. I would go into it with you. And maybe later on in life, they may come up. We live in, in the 21st century. Something would come up. And we can get this work out. It may not be in our country, but another country we could travel to wherever to get this thing work out for you. So it's for the individuals to really sit down and have that mature conversation and decide as to what they will do. All right. So <clears throat> I'm just reading the comments from Porson. So um, uh, miracles still happen. Karen says, if God allows, all things are possible. Dr. Andre says, Yakima says, um, it's not fair to say that simply because you got married as virgin, sex will be enjoyed because that would be the only normal you know. That's true. And would imagine that sex can be uncomfortable or distasteful even with two um, two virgins. That's true too. Um, so let us avoid normalizing unenjoyable sex, but openly regarding sex should not be the end at the marriage though. That's right. That is so, so true. But in terms of um, just going back to the question dear asked, huh, um, that is one of the recent ladies. I don't know if you haven't. It's not wrong. But I have started praying for my husband in terms of sexual organs and everything because it's a real, real deal. Um, I don't like the idea about it's okay to bring things to God while, while it is there. But I believe in seeing things beforehand and bringing it to God beforehand. So I have personally started praying for sex life, I have started praying for a whole lot, lot of stuff, even though I'm not married as yet. Because as Yakima rightly said, you can be virgins or not, and you, you, then again, it doesn't necessarily mean you will have this, the best sex life. So again, it comes back to the two individuals. For the question that Jay asks, honestly speaking, Lord Jesus, God will really have to speak to my heart to say, Shibiki, everything is going to be all right. Trust me. God will have to do that. I don't know how much I can I could depend on miracle to a point whereby I'm not going to enjoy sex. I am not going to um 
I'm not going to be able to have children because this is more than just having pleasurable moments. This is going into the fact that I may not be able to have biological children. I may have to adopt. Um, so there's a lot of things attached to it. And honestly speaking, I don't know what I would do in that situation. But God be my weakness. And that's why I am praying to God right now for my husband's functional organs. I am praying for my womb and everything. So ladies and men, I want to encourage you not don't wait until you're in a situation. Start praying to God. Just like how we pray for God for health and strength and everything. Let us be holistic in our prayers. So and uplift, um, uplift that young man, that young woman, woman. But until many times until a situation hits us, then is when we know exactly how um how we will deal with it. As Sheba said, from she, for her, it will she will love him until death do us part. That is the vow she said. Ashiba girlfriend, I know you're married now, but I don't know if you were if you were married and facing that situation, if you would have been making that same comment. I don't know. But girlfriend, I'm happy that you're happily married. And um, but the reality is when people are in that situation, we can tell, we can say in our comments, give God the praise, and God is gonna bring about a miracle. But when people are actually in a situation trying to enjoy something that God created. For you hoping that that should have been the best thing and you not being able to enjoy what God would have created. It's a difficult one to come by with. So I just want to end with our final question. Um, for, for some individuals who have already started having premarital sex for whatever reason, because people have started having sex for different reasons. I want us to look, that would God still forgive them? Because I don't want us to end and feel as if I don't want nobody to uh, feel as if because they've been sexually active, it's so bad. And, you know, don't leave this. We don't want you to leave this floor feeling judged, but God is able to heal and forgive. But let me hear from the panel. What, what, how would God treat a situation like that? And is it possible for that person, like individuals who would have started to be able to abstain? Let me hear you with those cl um, closing questions. Yeah. Um, we, what we must understand is that we are different people. Uh, the church is a diverse body. And we shouldn't come with the idea that the church is a perfect place and we have to be all um, righteous and sanctimonious as if we have never done nothing wrong in our lives. We mess up in many ways. There is no big sin, small sin. Sin is sin and we must be able to call sin by its name. Uh, yeah. If you look at a lot of success stories around the world, people were were drug addicts, people were porn addicts, and eventually these people encountered Jesus, and they are big pioneers and advocates for going against what they were captivated by, right? If we look in the, we have, even if we, we reference testimonies from the Bible, and we point it to the, the lives of these people that are struggling, they will find that salvation, and once we know about Christ's forgiveness, he says, come just as you are right he we, and in this time we tend to try to fix ourselves before we come to god and he's saying that you know we should come just as we are we have different stories in the bible we have stories like rahab uh we have mary magdalene mary magdalene she was a prostitute and she encountered jesus these people wanted to stone her the people around her but when she came to god when he wrote in the sun they left because you know he who is sinless let him cast the first stone there is no human being that is sinless for we are born in sinner shape in iniquity and you have people like Saul Saul was he he grew up thinking that killing the believers of Christ was the right thing that was that is what he was taught that was the environment that he was brought up in I know God took that same passion that was in him and he turned it around and if you look at the life of Paul, he was one of the the big pioneers of the Advent movement that we have today. So as long as we, you know, Moses was a murderer as well, right? And he went back to deliver God's people from 40 years out of the wilderness. So as long as we could, we could tell these people this story and that Christ offers that forgiveness. He doesn't condemn, he doesn't judge you, just come just as you are. And when you realize that, your whole your whole life is going to take a different trajectory is going to make a paradigm shift right yeah. once you start to encounter christ and we have once you have that uh and in um steps to christ it even mentions you know the closer that you come to god the clearer the clearer 
you start to see how faulty you were. And you're going to try to fix those things. And that is why we shouldn't judge others, right? Because we, are, we mess up in different ways, you know? Yes. Not because I wear the best tie, the best suit in church. I mean, I have a great relationship with God. I could be the most messed up person. And the person that dressed the most messed up is the one that has a closer relationship with God. So we must be able to come to God humbly, just as we are. And he, he is going to fix us. He is going to take us where he wants us to be. There are many people that have that have babies in the church out of out of wedlock. They have primar you know, there are different situations we face that cause us to go into these kind of situations. But I think and, and this is one thing for me that helped me to understand the forgiveness of God. The forgiveness of God is is unlike any other. And you know when he forgets that nobody can come and say, Oh, but she used to do that, you know. When they come to tell you that, you know, God already write it off. So you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. But I think, you know, you must have that desire to seek that forgiveness in Christ. You can't fix yourself. You have to talk to somebody. And the best person to talk to is no other body but Christ. Thank you so much, Daniel. Excellent submissions. I will say I I like Daniel's point. Um, yeah, Daniel's points. And you know, sometimes a lot of times persons try to fix themselves. So it's only God, you know. And you know, God, God, He loves the sinner, but He hates the sin. So we need to always keep that in mind in that he's always there willing you know sometimes we think because we're humans we think what other humans would think of us but god god is god and so it doesn't matter how far where you've been he has the power to renew you as long as you're willing to allow him because you know it's it's up to you as an individual to really seek god and allow him because you know you can go to him and state your problem and then you, you're not really, really ready to allow him to use you because he's not going to force himself upon you. Because, you know, he said that, you know, once we confess our sins, he's faithful and he's just, and he will definitely forgive us from all our sins. But when he forgives us, he don't expect us to go back into that same situation again because we're all sinners and one way or the other we falter. But he doesn't give, give us the right to continue dwelling down that path. He expects us to be a better individual, be a better person out there. So it doesn't matter if you're involved in it right now. This is not the end of the world. You're not the worst person on this earth. God still loves you. You are still his son, his daughter. And so he just wants you to come to him. He's right there. He just wants you to come to him and just really accept him and make that change. Because who knows? There are many persons out there who would have fought along life's journey and best believe they are persons who are helping the younger generation be a better generation to live. So, I mean, it's only for you to really surrender to God so that you can be a really role model to others, help them along the way because you're the best person to really talk to the younger folks, you know, mm -hmm. come online and let them know, hey, it's not going to be an easy journey, but, you know, with God, all things are definitely possible. Thank you so much, uh, Doreen. Excellent submission. Yeah, and I think they would have summed up, you know, the question and the argument pretty well. I just want to piggyback quickly on, you know, one of the things that Daniel would have mentioned, the story of Mary. If you look at Mary, she would have fell back several times into that sin. Yeah. And when you think yeah. about it, the sexual sin, it is so powerful mm -hmm. that when you decide to, to abstain, when you decide to overcome, there is a high tendency that you will fall back one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. But hey, all the time she fell back, Jesus forgave her. So to our audience, you know, even though you're trying to overcome and you may be falling back, don't be discouraged. People may say things, but don't be discouraged. If Jesus forgave Mary when she keep falling back, eventually she overcame, then Jesus will keep forgiving you until you overcome. The only sin that God will not forgive is the one we don't confess. I love that. Thank you. And you know, Shibiki, um, the story of Mary is, is an excellent example for the situation that we're talking about right now. You know, and even though 
all of that happened, you know, she was, Christ called her his best friend, you know, mm-hmm. she was his best friend. And, you know, she messed up, like Delon said, she messed up so many times that she came to the point, how many more times am I going to hurt him? And that is where you see her in her true devotion, that she was transformed. She went to offer herself with that alabaster box. She cried with her teeth and dried with her hair. You could have seen, you could picture the, the sincerity of how sorry she was. The Bible says a righteous man falls seven times and gets her back seven times. Cool. Right? So we have to understand as humans, we will sin, we will fall into temptation. And we cannot avoid temptation, but it's how we, we, we react to it. What we do when that temptation comes our way. Are we going to kneel down before Satan? Like, hmm. And when he says he's going to give us the world, or are we going to stand up in the face? and say that Christ is my father, and you know the word. The word is your bread. And, you know, you're studying this week's lesson study. It, it's talking about discipleship, and as Seventh-day Adventist youths, we must be able, they say, to make disciples. And, you know, to, when you're making disciples, you have persons who are weaker than you, um, yes. spiritually, people who are at the point where you were in your path, to where you are right now and you have to be able to be consistent with that person you know they are weak but you as the strong one be consistent in seeing them through discipleship so that one day they could do what you're doing too and one of the most effective things in discipleship and winning souls to christ is personal testimony personal testimony you know and when you you testify of what you've been through they eventually come to say they are a part of something as well, that these people, not because they grew up in the church, they never drink, smoke, had sex, or, or, or all these things. You know, people been through all these things, but they eventually came to a part in their life that they experienced God and they were humbled. And yes. you're never too young or never too old to experience Christ. That's right. Thank you so much, Daniel. And I want to just encourage our audience, and especially I want to just piggyback a bit on Tawina's point. So we, we understand that God forgives sin, and that's why it was important. There is no way I could have done a presentation like this or allow persons to speak and anybody to feel as if I have done the worst thing ever in my life because I've started having sex. Some persons were raped. Some persons were molested by father, cousin, some ancestral relationship. There's so many different reasons that persons would have uh, may have started having sex curiosity. Um, perhaps you trusted your boyfriend or your girlfriend so much and they would have, well, not necessarily forced because force would be rape, but then you were you were influenced or uh, into it and eventually decided to do it and you realized that was the worst mistake you made in your life. But I just want to encourage you today that God is willing and ready to listen However, one central point to note, though, is that we cannot continue doing the same thing all over again. Somebody mentioned, I think it's Jerry, somebody mentioned in the comment section, presumptuousness is a sin. If you have never knew about this information today, you have gotten the information. Don't use this information as a way of I have to still continue along my old way. God, whenever you, if you are, um, if you sincerely asking God for forgiveness and you feel as if, and we know that God is forgiving you, God expects each one of us to hold on to our end of responsibility, which means allowing him to gradually help us through that situation. So young man, young woman, and by the way, young men, sex is not having the, um, the best sex that is God's designed for reserve for marriage is not a young woman's thing. It should be a societal thing. So whether you're a man listening to me or you're a woman listening to me, it should both of us should work by the grace of God. It's not easy. We are bombarded by sex day and night. It is not easy, but with God, we can achieve it in this life. But we have to trust him. However, I just want to remind you, if you have started, call out to God, cry out to him. But some sometimes you may have to make very hard decision to leave. And let me tell you something, just to share a personal experience. I had to leave a relationship because of the very same thing, sex. I had to make a decision. Is it I have sex or I don't have sex? 
And the best decision I had to, at that point in time, the only decision that I saw that was fitted for me was to leave. But it was a hard decision I had to make. So sometimes we have to make very, very hard decisions in life. But when we make them, God is going to help us through the process. So I pray that God continue to bless you, strengthen you, those who are sexually active. And don't make it seem as if you can abstain now. Don't make nobody make you feel as if you can abstain now. You can, because as the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So um, Pastor Delon, I'm going to ask you to just close us off in prayer as we end this broadcast here today. All right, let us pray. Eternal Father who art in heaven, we are indeed thankful and grateful, O God, for your grace. We are thankful, dear Lord, for the gift that you have given us in sex that we are to use within the confines of marriage. We are thankful, O Lord, for all the education that we would have received today. And I pray, dear God, that even as we continue to live the remaining portions of our lives as Christians, that we may apply the right mindset when it comes to sex that we may educate our children that we may talk about it with our families and our friends that we may be well educated about it so that we can make the best decision i pray dear lord for those who are married that they may continue to have an enjoyable sex life and those who are not married dear father that they may continue to make that decision that pledge in their heart to not to sin against you dear father be with us i pray in jesus name amen, amen. I just want to say, folks, um, I have a YouTube channel that started just the other day officially. All the videos and the broadcasts we would have done, um, they're there on the YouTube channel. Please subscribe. You can type in the same um, page name, Issues in Focus with Shibiki Vivos. Um, go back. There are several presentations. So you can look at YouTube undisturbed, not like Facebook, when you have to contend with calls and messages. But you can look back at these programs so that you can be edified. Share the link with others, subscribe, and so that at the end of the day, we all can help each other. Join me again on Friday, um, Friday at 2 p.m. You are listening to Issues in Focus with Shibiki Vivos with my special guest. I want to say thank you very much to uh, Mr. Wiener Williams, all the way from Grenada, the Spice Island. Um, Dylan Basil from the wonderful island of Dominica, land of many rivers. Yes, I got it right. Um, <laughs> and then Daniel, I'm so proud of you, boy. I mean, Daniel, he, Daniel was just a, on the spot or the, um, person here today. I asked him to join me with one question, but I realized how knowledgeable he, he is on the topic. Um, and I'm so happy that you were able to stay on with us, Daniel. And Daniel is from Guyana, by the way. Uh, we also had teacher Melinda use. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here to give her submission because of internet issue, but she's from Guyana teacher, um, at heart. And, um, I know she was really preparing for this topic. We had Miss Maya, Maya Encarta. She is from um, the US, but originally our parents are from Nigeria. Uh, did I miss anyone? Oh, Gregory, I fell from, um, from Guyana also. So I'm thankful for my special guest for today. You really made my afternoon and I know the viewers enjoyed. Continue to support us as we continue to edify you. May God bless you all. See you again on Friday. <laughs>